Hello class. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about ancient Israel. And um, I have this uh, separate from Judaism. And later on, you'll see why. I mean, there there is a link, but there is a separate phase um, that we could really point out. And um, basically, ancient Israelites and the people of the Bible um, give us a different kind of picture than um, the Judaism that develops um, in the modern times. Um, in, in other words, rabbinic Judaism. Okay, so we'll get to that. Um, what I'm going to do now is just kind of start with where archaeologists uh, start with when it comes to tracing back who ancient Israelites um, were. Um, there's really relatively little data uh, just to point out. And, and as you've seen in my Mesopotamia lectures and looking at, even on Egypt, obviously the further we go back, it becomes more difficult to pin down things. So it just it makes sense, right? Um, and, and keep in mind, again, as I, especially as I go on this topic, uh, I'm going to go over what archaeologists um, and linguists and so forth have, and historians have, have um, went into on this topic. And then the, the later part, uh, later I'm going to just go over the biblical narrative itself. So um, the way that archaeology and historians um, point this out um, isn't to assume that the Bible isn't telling false history, and it's also not to assume that it's telling truthful history. Um, and that, again, is not an attack on the Bible per se. It's just the way that, that historians approach everything, okay, when it comes to um, looking at um, where texts add up to what they see uh, on the ground. And, of course, sometimes archaeologists have it wrong, and sometimes everybody has it wrong. And maybe even sometimes everybody has it right. Uh, anyways, um, okay, so going uh, to this, there is a uh, stele, uh, uh, a Merneptah stele, um, from the 13th century BCE, okay, and this is um, Egyptian text, and it mainly celebrates victory over the Libyans. But where it's interest, where, where there's interest here for our topic, is the last few lines boast about uh, a campaign in Canaan, um, which is, uh, by the way, when, when, um, Canaan Canaan. Um, as it's known, is where we refer to when we talk about Palestine, ancient Palestine, and or Israel, Judea, Samaria. There's different terms because different political circumstances and historic circumstances gave different name place uh, names to the place. But um, I'll kind of just try to help remind you with that. Uh, I don't want to confuse you, okay? But, um, you know... When we say Canaan or ancient Palestine, we're talking about also the same land that there was also ancient Israel, okay? And maybe as, I think as I go through this whole lecture, how come those names change around a little bit will, will be more clear to you, okay? Um, so what does it say? This claims that uh, in, in this um, large political propaganda piece, that Israel is laid to waste, his seed is not. Uh, that sounds like pure ethnic cleansing. It's probably basically a hyperbole for we really whooped them hardcore. Uh, okay, I'm um, not to like laugh about it, but I mean that's really what it's really saying. Um, and the other Canaanite cities were given a hieroglyphs for foreign land. Now, okay, so now here's where this is significant. Israel is thought of as a group of people, not an actual uh, uh, city state. Okay, in, in other words, the language that the uh, for, for Egyptologists who study hieroglyphs and all that and who can read these things, so there's certain markers that would indicate certain things linguistically, such as a, a foreign land or a state, right? Okay, or a city. And so, I mean, if the Egyptologists have it correct in their understanding of how the language was used at the time, then the implication is that Israel is big enough to be mentioned, maybe like a large tribe, but not necessarily a nation state. Okay, in other words, they're uh, a, a large group 
to be counted, but not they're not in the club of uh, city states yet. Okay, and it appeared that they were not restricted to geographical location. So again, this kind of implies that there might have been a nomadic kind of clan people, maybe a lot like the Bedouin. You know, it's it's not quite clear, but this is the implication that we get out of the text from this time. Okay. And so, um, if there's any questions on that, please um, call me. Now, what are we to make of this? Uh, almost 400 years before, there's there's almost a 400 year gap basically before Israel's mentioned again in ancient texts that have been found. So, that's a lot of time. Um, but it would actually make sense then if, if the text, if, if, if the stele was, was correct in saying that they were significant enough to be counted, but not necessarily a part of a, a nation state per se, um, we could conceive of them being around, obviously for a long time, but not necessarily making the news, so to speak, until uh, later developments. I mean, that would make sense. Of course, documents can be lost and so on. So, um, you know, uh, over time, perhaps we'll learn more. But here's what's interesting. So, I, so the question is posed, were they, were, were they Canaanite or not? Now, this one historian archaeologist, Noel, said, um, any communities in the region known now as southwestern Syria, Lebanon, Israel, West, western Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority might be designated a Canaanite by an ancient scribe. So what he's saying is, from an outside observer, the the Middle East, the Levantine uh, 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 Middle East, are basically now what he's saying is, if you look at the geography of the area that we call Syria, Israel slash Palestine and Jordan, um, this may have been seen by someone at the time as Canaanite culture. And uh, what it means is that linguistically and archaeological, like uh, uh, pottery, all these different kind of things, um, some of like, the gods would have looked very similar. And there is a significance to that um, uh, discussion because. The book of Joshua, which I need to explain, and I'll go into even more detail a little bit later, um, named after myself, uh, or my parents named me after um, Joshua. They were pacifist hippies, and they named me after the most violent war general of the Bible. <laughs> I think I've pointed out several of my lectures in the past. But anyways, uh, is the story of Israel conquering Canaan. And it's contradicted by current historical reconstructions. And so this is what I mean, okay? The Bible narrative, if you get the book of Joshua, is that the Jews were enslaved in Egypt. God has Moses lead them to the promised land. The promised land is somebody else's land. It's a land of Canaan's. And they uh, take over this land flowing with milk and honey. They kill off the population or, or, or kill off enough to make it their homeland. Okay, that is actually the story in a nutshell, of the book of Joshua. Now, for archaeologists and linguists, what's puzzling is that nothing in the Israeli uh, ancient Israel language and archaeological finds indicate anything other than them being indigenous to the area as opposed to uh, a foreign group coming over and dominating or kicking out um, the locals. And... You know, they, they, they do know what to look for. I mean, you have odd things in history like um, uh, the Norman conquest of the British Isles. The Normans were Norsemen, basically Viking, Germanic Vikings who take over a part of France, uh, Normandy. They actually end up preferring to speak the French language and they change their language over to the French language. Um, and so... You know, they, they, they take on a lot of the continents, cultures, and customs, but we can trace this all. Uh, um, and here we're just having a difficult time seeing any link between how ancient Israel would uh, um, be separate 
from the culture of the area. Um, I'm going to stop on there for a second, and I want to kind of cover that a little bit more on why that is and um, the implications of that. So I'll stop here and go to the next lecture.